Stacy, come on up. <laughs> I think you're in the far seat. All right, so I drew up a bunch of really complicated questions for you um, that you'll have no problem answering. So, um, but first, you know, I just kind of give it just a brief little background, but why don't you tell your story about how you got started in this business? Did you always think you wanted to be in fashion? I know you went to Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, but tell us how you got started. Um, I went to Penn, and I think I always knew I wanted to do something creative, but I definitely wasn't, you know, thinking like, oh, I'm going to, you know, start this global fashion brand when I was 20 years old. But um, what happened was, was that um, I actually built websites for a couple of years when um, I first graduated from school. And at the time, there were, everything was denim. There were no pants. And it was the beginning of what we now know as the contemporary market, where you had Theory and DVF, and everything else was denim, right. Earl, Seven. And, um, you know, I, I said, I want the cut of a jean, but I want it in, like, fun fabrics and, you know, crazy stripes and really novelty, um, you know, I want novelty pants. And in truth, how I started was I was making them for myself. And I made the first few pairs of pants, and I would get stopped everywhere I went. You know, where'd you get those pants? What are those pants? I want those pants. Um, and so, so how did you know how to make a pant? Well, um, I was actually building websites for uh, a clothing company that was actually housing four different brands. And um, I was in their offices every day working on, on like some sites for them. And one day I went up to one of the pattern makers and I said, can I, can I hire you to teach me how to do this? You know, I, I, this is the shape I want, this is the fit I want. You know, I know exactly what I want, but I don't you know, know anything about patterns. And, and she helped me make the first pair. Um, and then from there I started making them. And then um, what actually happened was um, I was in LA like running down the street and I got stopped by um, Lisa Klein, who mm -hmm. was like a kind of like fancy retailer at that time. And she was like, I want to I want to place an order for these. And so I was like, oh, my God, I've got to figure out how to, like, make, you know, 30 pairs of these. Um, and um, when I got back to New York, another friend of mine said, will you put on a fashion show with your pants? And I said, I don't I don't have tops. And um, I had done a website. That could have been interesting. Yeah, well, I, put, <laughs> the, I, I had done I had built a website for um, some florists. And I said, um, you know, I'll do the website for free if you'll make big bouquets for my runway show because I want the girls to walk just wearing pants and, and topless. Anyway, that got a little bit <laughs> See, of press. See, I actually had an that idea. Got a little, that, <laughs> that got a little bit of press, and uh, someone named Andrew Rosen um, came to uh, the show, which was at the Russian Tea Room, and um, he said, you know, I love this. This is like Theory's quirky little sister. Um, I want to help you. and." We became partners, and we've been partners ever since. Yeah, and it's been a great partnership. Of course, I had to learn a little bit about, you know, the first lesson was he was like, Stacy, you are not the fit model. <laughs> um, and so, I, you know, I had to learn the whole process. So the first few years of Alice and Olivia were really like me in school, right? Like I had to learn about everything from pattern making to production to, you know, everything you need to really, you know, produce a pant. Because, you know, the first thing Andrew told me, he was like, you could design the coolest pants in the world, but if they don't fit, you don't have a business. Exactly. And that's something I really kept true to the business from day one was, you know, you can design and, and create and imagine the most beautiful clothing, but at the end of the day, a woman has to put them on, feel really good in them, look really good in them, and be able to walk out the store without really altering them. Right. And Stacy's nickname is Stacy Pants to this to this day. Uh, so so describe who um, who buys your product. Who's the core customer? You know, we have a really big range, and one of the things I'm most proud of is that um, you know I feel like from when we started till now, our customers really grown up with us, and we have a true mother daughter shopper. So. Um, Michelle Obama wears a lot of our clothes and so do her two daughters. And I like to use that example because I think it really um, is a good example of, you know, the sort of uh, breadth of, of our customer. And, you know, I like to think that the clothes we make are um, for every woman. Um, it's a woman who likes to dress up. It's a woman who likes to have fun and a little bit of fantasy with her wardrobe. And it's also a woman who appreciates, you know, the quality and the workmanship of, of what we create. Yeah. I think that's right, and it's Brandon. I think you're right. I think you, we see the same broad appeal uh, at Bloomingdale's. Who, who's your favorite retailer you do business with? Obviously, Bloomingdale's. Okay, just a, <laughs> just wanted to, you know, just thought I'd ask that one. Okay, so you're you're uh, if, you know you're a female CEO in in a in a in a 
certainly in a, um, in a large company uh, world of, of male C CEOs. So what, what's that like? What's good about it? What's challenging about it? You know, um, I don't, it, I mean, I think, I never really think of it as challenging. You know, I mean, I started my company with, you know, my, my president is also a woman and we're a company of over 300 women around the world. And I never really think about like whether it's a male or female for the job. I just think it's who's best for the job. Um, and I can really rarely remember a moment where I felt any sort of like discrimination or anything for being a woman. Like to me, it's like, you know, if you're smart and you're hardworking and you know what you're doing, like that's what it's about. And um, but I do think that one of the things we've made a really conscious effort to do within the company and as part of our company culture is, you know, to embrace, embrace women and our, and our talent as, you know, they grow throughout their life. So, you know, we have like a 94% retention rate for um, women who have left and had children and come back to work for us. Wow, that's and huge. And that's a big part of our culture yeah. is really enabling the women in the company to really kind of have everything in their lives, you know, both their career and their motherhood. Yeah. Um, and you are a mother of three. Yes. Your youngest was seven months, I think. Almost six, six and a half months, yeah. Yeah. And so how's that? I mean, how's, how do you do, you know, be an active mother and, and run this business and uh, do all the things you do? Um, I mean, I do it the best I can. You know, there are moments that are really crazy. There are moments that are really exciting. There are moments where, like, I will admit to wanting to pull my hair out. Um, but I think the biggest part of it is really having, you know, the right support at home, in the office, and just managing your time correctly. And um, I don't think I'd be a better mother if I didn't work. Um, and, you know, I think that actually having children has helped me so much in terms of being a better manager of people and being more understanding of, you know, women and my staff and everything else. So, um, you know, I think like every working mother does, you do the best you can, you know, there are days where you're kind of like running out the door and putting your hair up while you're like getting in the car to go to work and, um, you know, but um, it's really just about having, um, for me, like I've We've got an amazing team around me that you know is able to kind of be flexible with whatever I need to do to kind of sometimes be in two places at one time. Yeah, well, apparently, and I and I remember um, when you had Athena that you were back to work yeah. like very quickly. Yeah, um, I went back to work. I had a C-section and I was back at the office um, literally like a week later, and you know that's. A tough decision for a mother you know some mothers feel like they need to be home with their baby for several months they need that bonding and for me like you know I have a situation where I have an office where she could come to work with me and so for me like running a company and having a lot of responsibility um, it was just almost less stressful for me to go right back to work but on my own hours and my own terms so you know Athena could come with me to the office I breastfed her I'm still breastfeeding her um, but I was able to... That's a little to too much information <laughs> for me. For, for some of us, but go, I'm sorry, go ahead. You know, I'm really open about these things. Um, I do it right in the middle of the office. I'll be in a fitting, and I'm like, Athena's here, guys. Um, but, um, you, know, that's, you know, that's my life. I think one of the things that I've made a really conscious effort to, to do is to make my children a part of my world. You know, I mean, I think when you're a creative person, when you're a designer, like, your work and your life are really one. And so... Um, you know, I, I try to incorporate them into my work life, you know, as much as I can. So yes, I did. Some people thought I was totally insane, but I was, you know, wearing my little brace and like back at the office um, a week after I had her. And I don't, it's not something that I think, you know, not every woman can do that. Sure. Not every woman has, you know, an office with a sofa and a bassinet that they can, you know, have that ability to do it in. But what I really try to advise mothers and working mothers to do is to just really think about what feels best for you. And, you know, some women, like, they almost feel guilt going back to work or guilt wanting to go back to work. And, um, you know, I think that it's important to just, like, acknowledge and discuss those feelings and, and really figure out what's going to work best, best for you and your family. Sure, sure. And obviously a little bit different for you in that you own the business. So, yeah, yeah, like, I'm allowed to sort of, <laughs> you know, arrange things in a way that, you know, I, I totally realize that not everyone can do. But I do try to make my office and my company as friendly as possible to women who have had children and are breastfeeding so that when they come back that tr transition is really comfortable. Sure. 
Okay, talk about um, marketing. How do you market your brand? What do you think are the best um, social media sites for you and for your brand? And yeah, about it. so um, I mean, we do some traditional marketing, right? Like in-store events. We do, um, you know, some advertisements in like Vogue and Elle and that kind of thing. Um, but social media has been become such a big part of what we do. And I've really always believed also in, you know, for our type of clothing and our type of brand and a lot of more like grassroots marketing. So, um, you know, we get a lot of press, we dress a lot of celebrities, a lot of celebrities walk in and buy our clothes. And to me, that sort of natural and organic press and marketing is, you know, has always been really important. But as we've grown globally, it's been um, important for us to have a little bit more of a marketing department, a marketing campaign, marketing plans, critical paths, all that kind of stuff. And so, um, Really, I think the most emphasis we place is on um, our social media. And um, people always say to me, oh my god, Instagram sounds just like you. And I'm like, yeah, it is me. So I handle our entire... <laughs> it really Insta is me. It yeah. is me. Um, I handle our entire Instagram account, but then obviously we have a team that handles our Pinterest, our Twitter, um, and you know, all of that has become you know, a hugely important for our brand and for every brand. I mean, I, I always say, like, I feel like we're in this day and age where every brand is basically its own media company. Um, you know, you're not waiting for a magazine to promote your clothes or to, you know, write about you. It's like you have your own voice and your own way to really um, tell the world who you are. You mentioned uh, celebrities. And so do you, how does that work? I mean, how do you get, you know, Jessica Alba to wear your clothes or, how do you, or whoever, whoever it is? Well, I mean, some of it's organic, right? Like, we have a store right on Melrose in LA, and a lot of celebrities just come in there and shop. Um, but then there's times, too, where there's, you know, stylists, and, and um, you know, they have people who will pull clothes for them for different events. And, um, you know, we've been really fortunate to have a pretty dedicated celebrity following who, um, you know, loves the fit of our clothing. And are they really easy to work with? <laughs> You know, I don't have to answer that because I, <laughs> I have a few people in between me and them that will handle things. So, you know, some are, some aren't. Yeah. Just Do you have like a favorite? Retailers. Do you have a favorite? Bloomingdale's. No, I, mean, I know that. <laughs> but I mean... I know that, absolutely. But do you have a favorite, like, Didn't celebrity? Did I prep well for this? Yeah, you did prep well. Did you, did you, um, uh, do you have a favorite celebrity oh that God. you work with? Um, I mean, you know, any, there, there's, there are a lot of celebrities that I'm just, like, so happy when they wear our clothes, but I mean, like, Beyonce's amazing. Like, yeah, she just sure. wore this black and white striped coat, which is one of my favorite pieces to the, the Obama's Easter egg hunt. Um, you know, when I see Michelle Obama in our clothes, you know, as the, you know, seeing the first lady in one of your skirts is pretty awesome. Um, I think Rihanna is a really important voice in fashion right now. Um, same with like the Jenner sisters. So those are they're really influential right now. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, let's talk about um, this uh, fashion show you did a couple of nights ago yeah. in Los Angeles. Tell, I mean, it's, it, this is a different kind of a show with a twist. Tell us how that worked. Tell us about it. So for the last few seasons, I think one of the things, you know, that the entire industry has sort of been aware of is that we spend all this money, all this effort, all this time on our fashion shows, and the customer wants it all right then and there, and then you don't capitalize on any of the sales from all of that buzz you've just created because the clothes aren't available for six months. So in February, a lot of people did what they called like buy now shows, but then you'd like go online and be like 16 week lead time. And you're like, that's not buy now. So I said in February, we're going to do our regular show, which we did um, because we do a presentation, which I feel like is important for all of our retail partners, yeah, all for of our fall wholesale delivery. partners for fall to see. Yeah. And I said, but in April, I really want to do a runway show and I want it to be what we called see now, buy now. Um, and we did it the other night in LA, two nights ago in LA, and it was pretty amazing. I mean, we showed looks, when I say see now, buy now, all the looks were available um, in store right now. So everything we showed on the runway, all the press that incurred, all the social media, Snapchat, Instagram, everything that you saw, you could literally like go online and buy those looks. Um, and it was the first time we've really ever done anything like that. And um, so far from what we've seen, it's been very successful. Um, and I think that's just the movement of the industry in general because, you know, a lot of the ways we promote and, you know, Fashion Week really is, is promotion, right? Yeah. It's really about, I mean, in truth, all the buyers, as you know, and all the editors, they come into the showroom for more like private appointments to really place their orders or pick their press pieces or whatever it is. Um, and the runway shows and the presentations have been 
so hugely about buzz, and so we want to capitalize from that buzz, and it doesn't work anymore the way it used to when you know, it would be the editors and they'd be sitting front row and they'd be picking the pieces, and the time frames matched up, so what the editors were choosing would come out in magazines a few months later, and what the buyers were buying would be in the stores at the same time. Now, everything editors and press and social media influencers are posting, you can't have. They want to be first. So the whole yeah. point, yeah, and so the whole point of the show was to give the customer an experience and something that was available right away. Um, and so we also created um, some limited edition pieces. We did a collaboration with the Grateful Dead, and we did some um, just limited edition Alice and Olivia items that were only available um, right after the show online. Um, and, you know, so far, I think it's, it's been pretty successful. And you know, the, so the difference when, when you do your February collection for fall, the buyers are going to choose, you know, what from from your runway collection and some other product that you have, right. what they're going to put in the stores. Here, you have to commit, right? Yeah. Yes. So this this you have you have to commit up front to what you're buying, what you're putting on the runway, because you now own everything. Yep. Right. And so that's a little bit more risky. I mean, so the reward is obvious. Right. You know, the, the 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 instant gratification for the consumer, but the risk is there too. The risk is there, but at the same time, I mean, you know, we have 33 stores that we're buying for anyway, and so we know what's going to be in store in, let's say, April or May or whatever. So it's not really risky. It's more promoting what's there. And I think there's going to be a lot of return in yeah, the industry to that concept of promoting what you own already versus trying to sell something that doesn't exist yeah, yet. Good point. Um, and I think it's going to be more and more important for not just us as brands, but even the larger retailers and the department stores to be, you know, kind of going back to the roots of doing events and things that really inspire the customer to shop and make them want to do something that's not just like on their computer at home. Um, and so I think by like having these shows and by doing things that, you know, are really engaging for the customer, it's just going to become more and more important. Right. So we've, uh, we've, you and I have talked about the international business. Um, both you're expanding internationally with, with, uh, mm -hmm. with bricks and mortar stores uh, international, but also talk about the, uh, the influence of international tourism yes. and how they impact your business in America. Yes, well we have um, now 33 stores around the world. 17 are in the US and 16 are overseas. Um, and there's, we've definitely seen in the last, you know, like I like guess four to six months, like a real slowdown in the tourists shopping here, like they're just not here. Like it used to be, you know, you can track in your stores, like you'd see the sales of, you know, there were three people in from Saudi Arabia, there were two people in from Russia, there were two people in from China. And there's definitely been a change, I guess, you know, the strength of the dollar, but it's, it'd be remiss to not acknowledge the fact that, um, you know, the international customer is not shopping here the way, you know, she was a year ago. Yeah, definitely. We, we, I mean, I've, I didn't say that here in my t comments, but I've, I've definitely said it in our um, analysis of the business and how it's performing because international tourism is a very big part of Macy's and Bloomingdale's business and Neiman's yep. and Saks and Bergdorf's and the high-end stores. Uh, and they're, A, it's both. They're not here, uh, and the ones who are here are not able you know their 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 euro or or their brazilian real or, or or whatever currency they're using is just simply doesn't buy what it used to buy the canadian dollar uh, just simply does not buy what it used to buy against the us dollar so it makes it very complicated i think that's going to be here for a while yeah we've we've definitely felt that in some of our stores especially a store like madison avenue that's usually you know so hugely trafficked with tourists we can we can really see that now, now how about your business now overseas you're in chi you're in china yeah, Where, yeah. Um, um, we have stores in Hong Kong and China, Singapore. Um, we have stores in the Middle East, um, and they're doing really well. Yeah. Uh, Tokyo also, so it's exciting. It's great to yeah. see the brand is, uh, you know, just as widely accepted in new places, new countries as yeah. it has been here in the United States. It's been it's been really exciting. I was just actually in Dubai a couple of weeks ago, and it was you know amazing to walk in and see kind of what we've done there, and to also see the potential for you know. The, how much more there is for us to do. Sure. Okay, so speaking of how much more there is to do, where do you, where do you see uh, the Alice and Olivia brand in five years? Um, I mean, I think right now, one of our, you know, our big emphasis is really on our own, you know, sort of it, it, improving our direct-to-consumer online and then also um, just our retail rollout. Like, we're really going to be um, emphasizing on opening stores all over the world um, and more stores in the U.S. Um, 
And in addition to that, we're also, um, we'll have beauty coming out in like the next like year and a half or so, and also eyewear. So we've got some exciting things coming. Yeah, new categories for you. And, and, and talk about, you know, the online business versus the bricks and mortar. Wait, don't you want to discuss the big counters you're going to give me at Bloomingdale's first? Well, I assume it's going to be exclusively available at Bloomingdale's. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't say no to me here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, wait, what was the other question? <laughs> uh, let's, we can stay on the exclusively available at Bloomingdale's if you'd like. Uh, Talk about it later. No, five years from now. If you try to envision where does the brand go, you're going to have you're going to have some new new business opportunities. You're going to have uh, some new categories. You're going to grow more stores. Well, what about the relationship of online to bricks yeah, and mortar? I think that the relationship between online and bricks and mortar is really so exciting. I think there's just more and more ways to engage the customer just like with technology in store and online. Um, and I think we've only just started to touch upon what we can do there. I think our industry in general has been like really behind um, and slow to, you know, sort of embrace what we can do with technology, you know? I mean, look, like the show I did two nights ago, I think in a couple of years, like, girls will just be able to, like, click and instantly have, you know, access to that outfit, like, in the middle of the show, you know? And there's, like, so many exciting things that I think we're going to be able to do to sort of, um, you know, immerse the consumer, you know, in in both like the digital and bricks and mortar worlds. Um, I think that virtual reality is actually something that within five years is gonna be an experience. You know, women will be like sitting at home with like a headset and feel like they're inside your store. The salesperson will be able to talk to them as if they're there and it'll be almost like, you know, you can feel and see and touch. But at the same time, I'm a true believer in like the actual bricks and mortar experience. Um, I think it's evolving. I think it's changing. I think, you know, if you're an appliance store or a big store, like your stores are showrooms now. They're not stores, right? But for clothing, for, you know, clothing that's as personal as ours is, I still think that, you know, a retail sp experience is something that a woman craves and wants, and you just have to keep making it better for her. Yeah. You have to make it feel, you know, more special, more luxurious. And again, I go back to that idea of, it going back to the olden days, you know? Like, I watched that show, Mr. Selfridge, and you see what that store was back in, like, the 1920s, and, you know, and, and the customer service, the elegance of it, and I think that's what we need to bring back to the retail experience a little bit. So what do you do for fun? I um, come to conferences like this. <laughs> <laughs> you really prepared um, well. That's you know, I have... Um, I, I, well, my, my hobby is yoga. That's like my non-working child time. But really for fun these days, you know, like, first of all, my work is fun, you know? Vintage yeah. shopping for me is fun. Like, picking out fabrics is fun. Um, but I also just spend all my free time really with my children. I mean, I have three amazing little girls. So they're my fun. Yeah. And my husband, I can't forget the husband. Don't forget Eric, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so we're gonna open it up to uh, the, the audience, and I wanna make sure we invite the students um, to, uh, to ask questions, because one of the things we always try to do when we bring someone like Stacy is uh, to, to expose the students uh, to, to you and, and to, uh, to then to get to know you as we've just tried to do here, but with their questions as well. So, questions back here? Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, so my question is, is uh, something I've been doing and thinking about a lot the past couple of years with like shopping. And also with like designers and creative directors and things like that. Um, so as a student, you know, decision making is really important. So can you talk about on your creative side and then your business side, the difference in, you know, making decisions and what that's like or if it's the same. So just discuss some of that, please. Well, Thank you. One of the things that I learned very early on was um, that I think the most important thing you can do in business is to hire people who are better than you. So when it came to the things that like I really, you know, weren't my focus, like let's say finance, I was like, I need a great CFO, I need a great president who's running, you know, the operational side of my business. And, you know, she's truly become, her name's Deanna, and she's become, you know, my true partner in everything we do together. And, you know, the way the company operates is that we really focused on building, um, you know, a foundation so creative can create. So yes, are there times in my day where I'm kind of like have both sides of the brain working and you know, I'm like, okay, I really wanna make this, but we have to do this at this price point and yes. But at the end of the day, the way the company operates is that you know, we've created like a pretty amazing foundation and infrastructure 
so that we can grow, we can be profitable, we can scale, but we can also be creative. Other questions? I can't see back there. So. I see a hands back there. But. Okay, so I like questions. <laughs> um, so with the, the decision making, what, what, do you, what would you consider, you know, what makes a good decision maker? Even though you set a good foundation, what, what do you believe that sets the, that foundation for making good uh, decisions? Making good like decisions? Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, part of making a good decision is having a point of view. So whether it's a point of view in terms of, you know, the business side or a point of view in terms of the creative side, you have to know exactly, you know, what it is. I think to answer your question, like, it depends. It depends what the problem is. You know, if I'm making a decision about fit, it's like I've got a point of view of what the fit should be and I'm able to make a decision. If I'm making a decision on, you know, whether we should create, you know, make a certain pair of pants or whatever, like in my company, there's like a little bit of a system of checks and balances, right? Like I work with my president, with my sales team, with my merchandising team, and, you know, we work together on, on a lot of the decision making. So when I say we built a foundation and, and how that affects our decision making process, it's like, you know, we've got a lot of creative people, but then we also have, you know, the people on the other side that are in charge of sort of um, making sure everything is profitable, makes money, and operates smoothly. Um, and in most of the things we're doing, whether we're buying for a store or whether we're styling for a show, you know, we've got a little team that's working together on things. Anybody else in the audience, by the way, if there are no more questions from students, if there, are, if there are. I see hands. I just. Um, I have, um, well, actually two and one. Um, one is, what was your first, um, like, shocking taste of reality when you entered into this compared to what you thought it was going to be? And secondly, um, could you share um, especially for the students, like one of the greatest myths that uh, you had to come to grips with in going into this venture. I couldn't hear the last. I part. couldn't hear. I couldn't hear the end of that question. Can you hear me better now? Now we can hear you better. Whoa! Yeah. <laughs> in stereo. Okay. So two questions. One is um, your first reality check. Like, what was your, that aha moment that you had when you were like, "Oh wow, this is what this business is really like." And then secondly, what's one of the greatest myths that you had to come to terms with in entering into um, this venture? Um, well, I think one of the like aha moments or like the sort of, it was very early on. I remember being like in our pant factory and you know, they were like so late on our first production runs and they had like sewn something incorrectly. And I was like, God, this is like really complicated. Um, and I think, you know, it, you know, you learn that kind of stuff early on, like production is, is you know, it's not, it's, it's a very still like manual process when you're making things. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm, now years later, there's still moments where, you know, things come in and you're like, oh my God, how did they like sew that that way or it messes up. So, you know, I think you see uh, as a customer, you know, you see the fashion shows, you see all the glamour of fashion, but there's a lot of real labor that like goes on behind the scenes to make all that happen. Um, you know, so that's what I would say was that sort of, you know, moment. It was like my first like week in business where I was like, God, this is, you know. And was there a myth of something that was believed that it just isn't true? A myth of, well, you know, I think, the, I guess it, the myth is also the same. I think, you know, a lot of times people see, you know, all the glamour and all the beauty we create and, you know, and the marketing and, and the vision of the brand. But I think sometimes people don't realize like all the like work that goes the on. The execution. Yeah, to like it's execute hard. and make that look so easy. Yeah. Right? So. Good. Questions? I see hands again. Just I was just curious at one point when growing and expanding your brand, you decided um, that you wanted to be a higher end, higher price brand? Did that come from what retailers you wanted to be in? Or did you see your clothes and you kind of knew that they were meant to be more of exclusive pieces? Well, we're, we really have a range. I mean, from, from the moment I started, you know, we were what we called, you know, contemporary or designer contemporary, which, you know, is a price point that isn't like your $5,000 dresses. It's really, you know, like clothing at prices that's pretty accessible to, you know, um, I think most people. Um, 
But a lot of, I guess, how we've evolved and grown the brand has been based on demand. So, you know, we do have gowns that are a higher price point, but that was because we saw this need for women who wanted to wear our dresses to more formal events, and they were like, God, we wish we just had, you know, your dress but full length. And um, most of the way we've grown the brand, not necessarily just in terms of price point, but just in general, has, you know, really been based on demand and based on things we think that, you know, our customer needs in our stores. Again, I see hands. So as someone who's been very successful in your industry and has obviously created a very strong team, what things do you do now to ensure that you continue to grow as a leader? Um, well, my friend Kate, who's here with me today, who runs my social media, um, earlier she said to me, Stace, one team, one dream. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you know, you really need that, I think, to grow in, in any capacity. It's important that you know, your team has a vision and your team has a dream and that that becomes one. Um, does that answer that or? Okay. <laughs> Five time for uh, probably one more. I see hands over here. Or, or microphone, go ahead. Hi, so I have a question for you. As a graduating senior who's looking for more creative roles in the fashion industry, how would you suggest hardening, harnessing your creativity to be as successful as you've become? Can you repeat that? Sorry. As a graduating senior who's like looking for more creative roles in the fashion industry, how do you suggest harnessing that creativity for, um, sorry, <laughs> into, and, uh, how do you suggest harnessing that creativity into, more, uh, into a successful career? Because I know there's a business side and creative side, so how do you balance both of those? Well, I mean, I think in terms of har harnessing your creativity yeah, or- like personally. What? Yeah, like harnessing your personal creativity okay. into the brand. Well, I think it's about, you know, it depends okay. on what your first job is and what role you go into. Um, you know, I mean, I always encourage students to sort of have internships when they're in college and see different sides of the industry because there's so many aspects of the industry to be creative in. You know, I mean, like to me, like social media right now is one of the most, you know, creative aspects of the world. Um, so whether you're going into design or whether you're going into social media, it's just about you know, I, I advise everyone to just work really hard and to sort of think through exactly what it is that you really love doing. Like, do you love actual, like, you know, clothing design or do you love, you know, more of the merchandising aspect of things? But I think, like, you find your creativity in the things that you love doing. Okay, um, I want to, uh, first of all, thank all of you, I'm gonna turn it over to Scott here in a second, but uh, I wanna thank all of you for, for being here, for your participation, uh, for, for everything you do for the center and for the, our students. Uh, and again, my strong encouragement and advice is if you want the best uh, employees for your, your company, there's no better place to go than the University of Arizona Retail Center. So I encourage you all to uh, hire as many as you can. And, um, and finally, I want to st thank uh, Stacy Bennett for, for being with us today and being our, our closer. You're, uh, you've done an amazing job. You've built an incredible company, thank and we're you. all very proud of you. Thank, thank you, Stacy. You.